I'm very excited to announce our first speaker of the evening, Abby Hafer. Dr. Hafer has a PhD in zoology from Oxford University and teaches human anatomy and physiology at Curry College. She is an expert on the interesting quirks of biology and zoology that discredit intelligent design. She is working on a new book scheduled to release in 2015, tentatively titled The Not-So-Intelligent Designer. This book will be about the biological ridiculousness of intelligent design and creationism and how they must be understood as political issues and not scientific ones. Tonight, Dr. Hafer will be speaking about animals that shouldn't exist according to intelligent design. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Abby Hafer. Thanks very much, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Now, one of the most entertaining things about evolution is the sheer weirdness of its results. Animals that no rational creator would come up with exist perfectly well in our evolved world. The reason for this is that evolution is incapable of planning. Not long-term planning, not short-term planning, it just can't plan. All that organisms do is stumble from one generation to the next, and as long as enough of them reproduce, the species keeps going. So vast changes can happen, but they do so in tiny increments, leading eventually to structures and systems that are needlessly complex. Whereas a good designer inventing something from scratch would have come up with something much simpler. In fact, one of the problems that people have with evolution is that it doesn't seem logical. And our minds like logic. Our minds want neat categories. Our minds want to have fixed answers. We have a human desire to sort things out and classify them and do it once and for all. Whether you're a biologist trying to figure out how to put every animal, plant, fungus, and microbe into its proper family, genus, and species, or an anthropologist trying for the umpteenth time to define human beings in a way that makes them different from anything else, or a biblical fundamentalist reading about birds in the air and fish in the sea and Adam naming all the animals in the entire world, let's face it, we like the idea of getting things sorted out. We also like the idea of doing this once and for all and getting it over with. We don't read about Adam going back and renaming all the animals again the next day. We also like the idea that plants and animals are static and will always do what they have always done. It's much tidier that way. This may be what we like, but it's not what we get. Biologists regularly tear their hair out trying to figure out how to classify various uncooperative organisms that do not fit neatly into the categories we've created. Anthropologists are regularly stymied when they try to come up with a definition for human beings that includes all humans but excludes everything else. And biblical fundamentalists have serious problems with transitional species. We human beings may like categories, but the rest of the natural world doesn't. This brings me to another reason why many people have trouble accepting evolution. Many animals seem to fit so perfectly into one category that people can't imagine them being in any other. Many animals have adaptations to their environments that seem so perfect that they can't imagine them living successfully in any other environment. So the idea of a species slowly changing over time and going from one category and into another and from one environment and into another seems wrong. We wonder how a species could survive while transitioning from being seemingly perfectly adapted to one environment to being seemingly perfectly adapted to a different one. It seems crazy. 
One of the classic examples of this is the problem is the idea of fish becoming land animals. How did fish transition from being sea creatures to being land animals? The specifications for land animals are very different from the specifications for seagoing ones. The transition seems impossible. In fact, any decent creationist or intelligent design proponent can tell you that fish were designed to live in water. They have gills to extract oxygen out of the water. They have fins and tails that allow them to swim. The idea that a fish might walk on land seems so obviously wrong to anti-evolutionists that they routinely ridicule the very idea that a fish might walk on land and use it as an example for why they say that evolution is wrong. There's just one problem with that, and here it is. This is a walking fish. It's called a mudskipper, and it's one of my favorite animals. Mudskippers live in intertidal swamps and mudflats, where water levels change every time the tide changes. When the tide comes in, this fish does what any sensible fish does when it is confronted with more water. It hops out and climbs a tree. I am not joking. Here is a photograph of a mudskipper climbing a tree. Now, any decent creationist or proponent of intelligent design can tell you that fish should not climb trees. But the mudskippers failed to listen to all of those religious entreaties and went right ahead and evolved in intertidal areas where the tide coming in means that big predatory fish that swim in deep water can come in along with the tide. So getting out of the water to avoid predators, even by scrambling into trees, can help an animal to survive. Now, Let's just stop right here. Take another look at that picture. It's a fish climbing a tree. How cool is that? The famous essayist Thomas Carlyle said that wonder is the basis of worship. And I am serving you wonder right here, right now, on a silver platter. I am willing to bet some serious money that when you got out of bed this morning, you didn't expect to see a fish climbing a tree. I am also willing to assert that this fish, though it is an evolved creature, is a miracle anyway. In fact, it is my favorite kind of miracle, the kind that actually happens. In fact, although I'm giving this talk this evening because it's almost Darwin's birthday, it is also almost Valentine's Day, and I've realized that this talk is my Valentine to the animal kingdom. <laughs> but getting back to the topic at hand, a decent proponent of intelligent design could tell you that if you are going to make climbing gear, you should not start with fish fins. Unfortunately for them, they didn't tell this to the fish. Mudskippers also have special fused pelvic fins that help them to climb trees. Here is a picture of the fins that mudskippers use to climb trees. As climbing gear, they're kind of strange, but they work well enough, and they help the mudskippers survive to reproduce. It gets weirder. Not only do these mudskipper fish walk, skip, hunt, and climb trees on land, they even build their nests on land. Here is a photograph of a mudskipper's nesting burrow on land. It gets weirder still. The eggs that hatch inside the burrow develop in air, not water. That's right, these fish breed out of water and develop their eggs out of water. What's more, when oxygen levels get too low inside the burrow, the male gulps air, yes, air, 
from outside the burrow and transports it into the egg chamber in its mouth and then releases the higher oxygen air into the egg chamber so that the developing eggs get enough oxygen from the air. These fish have gills, but they do their breathing through their skins and through sacs of air that they trap in their skins. These air sacs are basically simple lungs. These fish can swim and do, but they spend as much as 90% of their lives out of water. As usual, intelligent design proponents have failed to look at biology. As examples of design, these fish fail miserably unless you posit that the designer has a very weird sense of humor. But as examples of the strange and wonderful variety of life that comes out of evolution, these fish are marvelous. Now let's move on to another topic beloved by religion, death. One of the fundamental aspects of the human condition is that we are going to die and we know it. This has driven human beings in countless ways. One of the things that this looming knowledge has done has been to make us both yearn and strive for immortality. For thousands of years, the desire for immortality and eternal use, youth has driven us. This is reflected in literature from the Epic of Gilgamesh to the picture of Dorian Gray. It drove alchemists to try and find the philosopher's stone, and it drove Ponce de Leon to explore what is now Florida. As for religion, striving for immortality practically wrote the book. From the immortals at Valhalla and Mount Olympus, to the turnings of the Buddhist's wheel, to the afterlife promised by Hinduism, Sikhism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, Islam, Judaism, and Baha'i, the desire to defeat death in some way is fundamental to much of human belief. Even Steve Jobs famously said, no one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. Even at a more material level, when we ask the question, why do we have to die? Doctors and scientists will give you an answer along the lines of, well, if you manage to not die from a host of diseases, then eventually you will get so old that your systems will break down, too many mutations will have occurred, your telomeres will have unraveled, and eventually you'll just simply croak. This may not be satisfying, but at least it seems realistic. Death just seems to be a bit of unavoidable biological reality. But, what if somebody else got immortality and we didn't? Would this seem fair? Would we still see ourselves as the pinnacle of creation? Would we believe that we were intelligently designed? What if the designer awarded immortality this most sought after state of being? to a jellyfish. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, the true immortal, known as the immortal jellyfish. This species of jellyfish, Teratopsis nutricula, can live basically forever. They can avoid death altogether. If these creatures are stressed by wounds, heat, starvation, or even simple old age, they can simply revert to juvenile form, make new baby copies of themselves, and start all over again. This would be like an insect reverting to being larva, then making new copies of that larva, all of which can then grow up. If this were a human being, it would mean reverting to being a child, making dozens of copies of that child, and then letting them all grow up. If the child or the adult it becomes at any stage in its life finds itself wounded without food, senile, or otherwise in distress, it can again regress to childhood, remultiply, and start all over again. 
over and over again without end. So the immortal jellyfish doesn't just have eternal life. It has eternal youth, or at least continuously restarting youth. Ponce de Leon can eat his heart out. But seriously, why didn't the designer do that for us? Just think. We wouldn't need plastic surgeons anymore. And no more Botox. Think of all the charlatans we could do away with. No more mega vitamin regimens. No more hormone replacement therapy. And no more religions telling you that you can have eternal life after you die, but only if you do everything just right. And nobody can tell you ahead of time if you're going to make the cut. And you don't get to see for yourself if it really works because nobody ever comes back to tell you what it's like. All that would be gone. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is why intelligent design hates biology. Biology comes up with too many pesky facts to fit into their neat little philosophy. So what are we to make of this? You've just seen a fish that happily defi defies the categories that humans try to make for it, and a jellyfish that knocks some of humankind's fondest aspirations into a cocked hat. In fact, if there's one thing that studying zoology has taught me, it's humility. What's more, one of the standard criticisms of science is that it has demoted human beings. First, Galileo came along and pointed out that we're not the center of the universe. Then Darwin came along and pointed out that we're not made by God and we're not the pinnacle of creation. What a come down. But I think there's another way of looking at this, which is best illustrated by an old bad joke. It goes like this. A Buddhist goes to a hot dog stand, and the vendor asks him, hey, buddy, what can I make you? And the Buddhist replies, make me one with everything. So the vendor gives him a hot dog, and the Buddhist gives the vendor a $20 bill. After a moment of waiting, the Buddhist asks the vendor, where's my change? And the vendor smiles and replies, ah, change must come from within. This joke encapsulates two really good ideas. First, you've got to change your outlook. Humility is good for you. Learning biology does tend to teach you humility. Learning about the rest of the cosmos teaches you even more humility. But second, if you put aside your separateness, you get to be a part of everything else. We may not be separately created by God and at the pinnacle of creation, but science teaches us that we are most certainly one with everything, and that everything that we are a part of is grand. In biology, we now understand that we really are related to everything else that's on this earth that ever was alive or is alive today. So let me introduce you to your family. This is one biologist's version of our family tree. As usual, various bits of it could go one place or another depending on your viewpoint, but this one shows us the big picture pretty well. First, bacteria over on the left. Bacteria are everywhere. There are bacteria over a mile above the Earth's surface and two miles below it. By the way, there are more bacteria in your intestines right now than there are people on Earth at present. So have some respect for our bacterial cousins. Next, archaea, a branch of the family tree so old that they were only recently comprehended. And finally, over on the right, onto the branch that has all the organisms with cells like ours. Go out, 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 until we finally get to animals. That little tiny twig on the upper right-hand side. 
that contains us, our dogs, cats, budgie birds, clams, jellyfish, dinosaurs, mosquitoes, trilobites, and every other animal that exists or ever has existed here on Earth. That one tiny twig is our place in the great tree of life. Feeling humble now? Good. Let's get more humble. Here's our place in the galaxy. Now, this isn't actually a picture of our Milky Way galaxy because we haven't been able to get cameras outside of our galaxy to take the picture. But this galaxy is a lot like ours, and the arrow does show you roughly our position in the Milky Way. Every one of those dots is a star, of course, and we are now finding out that many stars have some sort of planets around them. What's more, some of those planets are rocks of about the same size as Earth. And even if the percentage is very low, there are a whole lot of stars out there, like roughly 400 billion in the Milky Way alone. So Earth-like planets or no, you have to admit we're not a very big piece in the great scheme of things but you also have to admit that this scheme of things is pretty magnificent. So look at all those stars and realize that our entire solar system is one minuscule speck in a galaxy like this. Feeling humble now? Good. Let's get even more humble. This is one of the greatest pictures ever taken. It's one of the famous deep field photographs taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. To take this picture, scientists aimed a powerful telescope at a piece of the sky the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. Then they looked very deep into space just to see what they could find. What they found was about 10,000 galaxies. Just about all the blobs and dots that you see in this photograph are separate galaxies. Some of them, you can see, look the way the Milky Way does. All this in one tiny speck of space the size of a grain of sand. Multiply that by the size of the sky all around us, and the mind boggles at the thought. What's more, in this shot alone, you can see a fabulous array of galaxies. This photograph is jaw-dropping. And remember, within each of these galaxies, a solar system like ours is just a tiny speck inside it. Again. Within each of these galaxies, a solar system like ours is just a tiny speck inside it. Isn't that amazing? It does show us that we're pretty small, but it also gives us wonder. And wonder is the basis of worship. So you've gotten a good dose of humility this evening. You've seen that your place in life on Earth isn't all that significant, and your place in the universe is even less significant. Please understand that if all life on Earth were wiped out, it wouldn't matter one whit to the universe at large. The only place where our actions matter is here on Earth. As you saw from that great tree of life that I showed you, if all human life were wiped out, bacteria would keep on going much as they have for millennia. What's more, it's clear that we are not particularly favored by any god or gods, whatever our egos may tell us to the contrary. Does that mean we're worthless? Far from it we can experience awe and wonder. We have an amazing ability to figure things out. We make art and appreciate beauty. We can build cities, yet appreciate wilderness. 
We can strive to be the best that we can be and to build the best society that we can build. We can require justice in the firm knowledge that no one has divine rights. And we can love each other and love this planet. Thank you.